Hi, I'm Dr. David Hasey with the Maxwell Clinic. And uh, as a busy physician, I know it, you have a busy schedule and it, uh, every moment counts. So thanks for taking your time to learn a bit more about what we're doing here at Maxwell Clinic. A little bit about myself. I'm a Vanderbilt Medical School graduate, uh, went to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, did my residency in family medicine, practiced rural primary care, really getting in deep with patients of ran emergency rooms, and in 2003, um, I followed a passion of mine, which is to figure out um, how can we apply basic and clinical science to this idea of what creates health. And I started this clinic called Maxwell Clinic. And um, we take care of patients that uh, are not having the results that they desire in, in the current uh, healthcare system, uh, which you know full well, um, it's hard. Um, a lot of our patients are uh, don't have issues that are readily treatable, uh, and, and the system as a whole really oppresses physicians, and um, and it it's, doesn't make it easy to take good care of patients, and um, so uh, we've been trying to do our best for many years in that domain, um, and uh, in doing trying to always think about, well, what can basic science and what can early clinical science teach us to um, improve the care of patients uh, for these complex chronic issues? You know, I love doctors. Uh, I think that uh, we have an amazing heart. Um, I, my medical school graduates from Vanderbilt are people I still keep in contact with. And, um, and it's really a challenge to necessarily know um, who to trust out there. So I'm putting all this information out. I want you to understand what we're about, um, why we are doing what we're doing with regard to this approach to plasma exchange, and, and just uh, how we could potentially partner together to take care of patients that are in need. Uh, innovation in healthcare is really hard. Um, the insurance industry, um, the um, the, the structures, the regulatory agencies are all things that are really helpful for certain purposes, but hard when we're not able to move forward in science in the way we want. And I was really surprised in medical school, I didn't even, or in residency, I never heard of plasma exchange. Um, you know, here is this medical procedure that's really well established for the treatment of severe autoimmune disease, but because Plasma exchange doesn't really have a specialty home. You know, neurologists, internal medicine doctors, intensivists, ne uh, nephrologists, um, uh, family doctors, emergency medicine doctors, everybody that does apheresis does it because it's really a passion, not really because it's an easy path. Um, because the people or the patients and the conditions that are treated are often kind of edge case scenarios. And um, so at, when I go to our annual professional meeting, the American Society for Apheresis Medicine, uh, for which I have a, a, a qualification in apheresis from the uh, American Society for Clinical Pathology, um, that is, uh, it's an amazing organization of doctors that, um, you know, are, are willing to put up with uh, the challenges of of patient situations that are not necessarily straightforward. You know, there's kind of an old joke in apheresis that, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the last, last gasp, but, you know, when in doubt, apheresis it out, <laughs> used to be a saying. And so there's some really good um, uh, guidelines in the American Society for Apheresis Medicine uh, for when plasma exchange is indicated for particular conditions. And most all of those conditions center around autoimmune disease uh, and different neurologic conditions um, and conditions of various toxicities. The grading of evidence is often very low for any one condition because there's so few of these procedures done in comparison with the rest of uh, what happens in healthcare. And, and so um, this has always been a field that's challenging to study because we're treating sometimes the sickest of the sick uh, and uh, we don't have a lot of data for some conditions, but we are getting better and better at that. And I love my colleagues in apheresis medicine. Um, so here at Maxwell Clinic, we're filling a need for 
the outpatient availability of therapeutic plasma exchange uh, for the treatment of autoimmune disease that uh, doesn't have a home or a patient can't find a, a care provider for those conditions. Uh, and then also moving f the science forward with regard to its application in the treatment of neurodegenerative disease, uh, as well as its potential benefit for promoting longevity. And so um, here at Maxwell Clinic, we have right, um, four IRB-approved trials uh, going currently with regard to plasma exchange and its various applications. Uh, we've run an amazing study. We're very excited about a, a publication coming out on the advanced understanding of plasma exchange as it actually reverses markers of aging, uh, where we did large-scale single-cell transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics, cognitive testing, um, you know, various measurements of uh, you know, physiologic function uh, to see how do we nudge those factors. But I believe that it's very important to over-determine safety whenever one's doing medical procedures. And there are many factors that can be optimized to improve safety. Uh, we've been trying, at Maxwell Clinic, we've been trying to take this into account. And we call what we do habitat optimizing plasma exchange. And the habitat is the clinical habitat that you're in, you know. Um, how are we going to, first of all, get access? Uh, we make every effort possible of getting peripheral venous access rather than central access, and that immediately uh, decreases the likelihood of severe adverse events with regard to plasma exchange. And we also do uh, a high degree of customization for each individual person that we would recognize what are the things that may need to be added in for their particular care. Um, how do we uh, especially track that individual through the course of time? We have protocols in place where we do extensive testing, where we understand better how, what may need to be added in, not just what needs to be taken away. Um, we're very proud of the you know, unique way that we're doing this, and we're applying ourselves to uh, research and publish these results so that the field can continue to get better and that we can make this more available to many people across the world. The thing that really pushed me into saying, no, we need to make this available, we need to make this more available, was the AMBAR trial. The AMBAR trial, you probably didn't hear of it because it didn't get any press. It happened, it was released in July of 2020 at the height of the COVID pandemic. Everybody was locked down and thinking about something very different <laughs> than, than uh, the application of plasma exchange for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. But the AMBAR trial is a remarkable study and we have a whole bunch of resources listed below on this page for you uh, to dive in more deeply in this area. So some of, the, some of the findings were taking a look at the PET scans of individuals who are in the treatment arm versus placebo arm and seeing that there was less metabolic degeneration in the individuals that were in the treatment arm. And they're looking at biomarkers in the CSF of amyloid beta and tau, seeing uh, changes indicative of a potential improvement uh, in the, meta, in the uh, clinical condition. Uh, but what's really remarkable is how many cognitive findings as well as findings of improved function and findings of improved function uh, through the eyes of the caregiver that were present in the study. The one downside is one of the primary endpoints, the co-primary endpoints, hit a p-value of 0 0.06. And so just outside the um, arbitrary line that we've made for what statistical significance is in a clinical trial. And so that one small finding, some individuals have said, well, it's not a positive study. And I would say by the strict criteria, it was not a positive study, but oh my gosh, from a clinical standpoint, as a clinician looking at this, um, it was highly clinically significant. And, um, and if had they chose any one of a number of other of the cognitive endpoints, all of which had very strong statistical significance, uh, it would have been 
there wouldn't have been any theoretical pushback to the findings of the study. I think it's a very strong study. And it has actually been supported by observational data that has been accumulated since that time um, by the ACE Center uh, in Barcelona, Spain, um, who have really has been spearheading this entire effort. Uh, Dr. Marci Broda, um, the primary author of the MBAR study, um, can, has been tracking thousands of patients that have been getting plasma exchange. And in their longitudinal findings, they recognize that uh, individuals with Alzheimer's disease that receive regular plasma exchange, uh, nearly 70% of those individuals uh, do not progress. Um, now there is uh, another 30% that do, uh, but it's a really quite remarkable finding to see the, um, the community-based care of individuals with really substantial Alzheimer's disease improve. I also became very interested in the mechanism of why this must be occurring. And if we come back to basic science and we are start to understand progenitor cell behavior, um, you know, we have tissue-based progenitor cells everywhere in the body that do the work of healing. And what's easily seen in laboratory animals and in, in uh, bench science is that if you put a progenitor cell or a stem cell in an old environment, it will behave old. If you take a old, progenitor cell and put it into a clean or a young environment, it will behave young. The habitat of the cell is really where it's at. And uh, we also know that you know, the habitats our patients are in determine their outcome uh, or in their progression or the development of disease substantially. So too is it with cells. The cleaner and healthier the habitat, the more likelihood those cells are going to do the job of healing. And I believe this is the central learning that we get from plasma exchange. And so to op optimize habitat by not just doing plasma exchange to remove uh, the factors that are in the bloodstream, whether those are ant autoantibodies or senescence factors or, um, or cytokines or inflammasomes or um, markers of uh, atrophy or um, you know, the, the list goes on and on about what is removed during a total plasma exchange. Um, if you remove those things out, we should also think about what do we put in? How do we support that individual to um, have the, the best possible outcomes? Uh, that can include such, you know, putting in things such as calcium to decrease the likelihood of hypocalcemia during the event. Um, and a multitude of other factors depending upon that person's clinical situation. I'm very passionate about this. I think this is a field that is going to be growing and I really and, and I really want to thank all of you that have already sent patients to us for uh, to be able to share in their care. Uh, we really take that as a deep honor and, um, and recognize that you're you know, doing the very best to bring the new science and techniques to your patients. Um, but interestingly enough, the American Society for Apheresis Medicine um, is publishing recommendations for the use of apheresis in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease um, that puts this into a category of uh, clinician um, judgment, and um, which is, it's, Anyway, it's very, very interesting. I've gotten to sit with many of the heads of apheresis from multiple institutions from across the world, and um, everybody is in this very strong agreement of the importance of this therapy as we start to do everything possible to reverse the course of severe neurodegenerative disease. And anyway, it's really an exciting time. So anyway, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, we have a whole bunch of resources below. Uh, and um, and uh, let us know if there's anything that we can do to help serve your patients better. Take care. Bye-bye.